in the world and they recommend that it be used everywhere in the world. And that's one reason it's, it's so good is because it can be used everywhere in the world if you have the data. And so that's one of the drawbacks of this method is that it's data intense, uh, the data requirement is intensive. We have here net radiation, soil heat flux, air temperature, wind speed. This is the saturated vapor pressure and actual vapor pressure, which relate to humidity. And then there are some other physical constants in here. But um, basically, it takes a lot of data to, to use that equation. But nowadays, um, weather stations routinely uh, uh, collect that kind of data. And in fact, uh, the, the, the weather stations now even internally calculate this equation. Uh, so so it's, not, it's not difficult to get this uh, nowadays. Um, another, the no, second method is the Priestley-Taylor. And if, if you notice, it's actually a simplification of the previous equation. Uh, in this area right in here, uh, we have basically the same, same uh, part of that, that uh, equation, previous equation. But it includes here something called the Priestley-Taylor constant. And it's, it's very simple, and so we'd like to look at that. And the third equation is the hargrave samani equation. And it depends on solar radiation and air temperature as opposed to uh, solar radiation as opposed to net radiation. What is net radiation? Net radiation is the balance of the, or I should say the sum of the incoming short and long wave radiation minus the outgoing short and long wave radiation, where the outgoing short wave would be reflected. Uh, and so the, the method that we're going to use is the method of uh, Gautier, which was originally developed in 1980, and uh, Dayak and Gautier improved that in 1983. Gautier is from, I believe, from the University of Montreal, and Dayak is at the university, was at the University of uh, Wisconsin. And what they found was that this method uh, was relatively simple, but it did a really nice job. So it has not been uh, modified too much over the years. And the most recent, well, I guess the most recent application was here in Puerto Rico, but prior to that it was in Florida. And they've done very extensive testing of this uh, solar radiation method in, in Florida and found that it works quite well and, and of course applied some calibration to it so you can, you can improve it with calibration. Now let, let's step back a second. Why do we, why is solar radiation even being measured with um, remote sensing? The reason is that we have a problem with our sensors for solar radiation. They're, they're called pyranometers. Uh, that's one type, and they are very, very, there are very few, you could say, here in Puerto Rico. When I started to work here in around the year 2000, I couldn't find any long-term solar radiation data except in the airport here in San Juan. Since then, there, the USDA, NRCS, uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, has install several long, uh, you know, very good sensors that the data is available on the web, almost real time. Uh, at Hobos Bay, they have data. They, you know, now there's various places you can get it, but still there's a lot of gaps. Spatially, there's a lot of gaps. So what we'd like to do is use uh, remote sensing so that in effect, we have a pyranometer every square kilometer. And it's, it, it's a little problematic when you think about the fact that the, the remote sensing instrument can only see what's in front of it. So if there's a cloud in front of it, it's going to see the cloud. It doesn't see the ground, and, and that's what we want. We want the solar radiation at the ground because that's where the trees and the plants are, right? So they started out with this clean air model and it's basically a radiation energy balance. 
with this, uh, this is called the extraterrestrial radiation. It's the radiation that hits the outer atmosphere, and it's very constant, and there, you can find the, these, uh, these estimates in the literature, uh, in tables, as a matter of fact. So if you know where you are, you know what day of the year it is, and where you are on the Earth, you can determine what that extraterrestrial radiation is. Uh, the remote sensing device, okay, so, so that, that solar radiation comes in, it's scattered, some goes back out to space, some continues on, some is absorbed by the aerosols in the atmosphere, and then, and then it reaches the surface. Some is reflected back and scattered, and some is absorbed again and then goes out to space. And the combination of those are shown here, shortwave out, and that's what, the, so that's what the remote sensing instrument sees. But when you put all these equations together, you can, you can derive this shortwave down, uh, which is at the surface. And so that's for the clear model condition. When you have clouds, you have some additional absorption and they're accounted for by these parameters here. And so you end up finally with this equation here. Um, and so it does a, a pretty nice job. These are some examples from the 1980 publication where they found that the uh, pyranometer, which is the blocky data, was uh, as compared to the remote sensing data, which is the smooth data, was within about 10%. And since the, the pyranometer is about 5% accurate anyhow, uh, being within 10% of that value is pretty good. And like I said, if, if you calibrate it, you can, you can improve it. These were not calibrated, uh, these results. And so basically what you have here is time of day and the, the energy here, radiant energy is in watts per meter squared. That first equation, Pendamanti needed temperature. So the way we, we determined that was to uh, go back to that earlier work where temperature was related to elevation. That gave us a mean daily temperature. But then we, we, we nudged, or you could say adjusted the data with real-time daily data. So now nowadays, the beauty of the internet is that we have real-time data. So we can go use that long-term average, which produces temperatures all over the island, and then go to selected weather stations and see what the actual temperature is, and then fix or adjust the, 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 the estimate uh, to make it more realistic. And we do that, or we did that in this case with these seven stations. These are the natural resource conservation stations. And they produce these data over here. But we were primarily interested in temperature and um, for, for that nudging. And these are the data for that date, March 5th. Uh, we have the elevation of the station. These are the seven stations rainfall, average temperature, minimum temperature, maximum temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, and solar radiation. And wind speed um, is also a, a, a input into that first model um, equation. And that's a little problematic 